All right, guys, we're kicking off this week with my friends at High Timber Dreams. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Western Huntsman Podcast. This is Jim Huntsman, your host, coming at you from the Broken Tan Studio right here in Clark Fork, Idaho. Uh, actually, guys, that's a lie. That's a lie. Uh, wh- wh- at the point of which I release this episode, I won't be coming at you from the studio here. Uh, I'll be I'll be in the backcountry hunting elk, uh, hopefully packing elk off the mountain, and hopefully even more so, you guys are out there hunting packing elk off the mountain uh so this is uh being recorded during this uh the the week uh i don't know how many of you played high school football but uh, you know right before season actually started you did like hell week (laughs) where it's like two practices a day sometimes three practices a day uh for a week straight that's kind of what i'm doing right now for the podcast i'm trying to knock out a bunch of episodes uh so i because last year i don't know if you if you guys listened last year you'll know uh, I went dark for like three weeks because I was hunting and didn't have enough episodes built up. So I'm trying to prevent that this year. It's uh, it's a little harder than it sounds. But this week I got a really good um, episode lined up with somebody that you know I've I've been following for a long time. I've been really wanting to get them on the show, and there I, I really like their entire platform and what they do and what they stand for. The they're principled, uh, and this is this is a great outfit. And so please welcome my good buddy. Ryan Gaskin from High Timber Dreams. Ryan, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Jim, and I uh, want to say thank you right off the bat for uh, having us on your show. We really appreciate it. Hey, anytime. No, it's it's uh, it's the pleasure's all mine. It, everybody's like, hey, thanks for having me on your show, but r- really, it's it's you're doing me a bigger favor than I'm doing you. So uh, I I couldn't do this show without folks like you and. And uh, I really enjoy doing it and getting to know, like you and I just met for the first time in person tonight as as, uh, on the phone here. Um, And so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, us too. Greatly looking forward to it. It it, uh, works for both of us very well. I'm still kind of in shock, Ryan, about the temperatures you said that you had. You've been upwards of around 118 in in Oregon. Yeah, well, we live at high elevation, and we do get the uh, the evening the evening sun and the sunset every night. But regardless of what your uh, thermometer says, if you're standing out there in it, that's how hot it is. Yeah. Oh, I know. Seriously. Um, yeah, I can't figure out the thermometer thing, man. I, I put it in the shade. It's wrong. I put it in the sun. It's way high. Um, so whatever. It is what it is. Uh, I Let's kick it off, Ryan. Uh, tell everybody about High Timber Dreams and where the idea came from and what you guys stand for i think uh i think people are going to get a lot out of this well we're we're a 501c3 uh non-profit organization basically a public charity um we focus on the support of the needs of veterans active duty soldiers first responders and youth um, by providing hunting and fishing and outdoor activities to support their emotional and mental well-being um, we are trying to become more youth oriented. Uh, we haven't had a lot of opportunities with our youth yet, but we are working with some very good sponsors we have um, to make the youth events impactful. I mean, right now we could do some small youth events. We help out the FFA and we've done some things for youth that's graduating and entered the military and whatnot, but we don't really want to, we don't really want to jump full on board with that because um, it's going to be a big part of our organization until it can be special impactful uh right sponsorships guaranteed results um reach as many as we can and until we can get to that point we're just not going to do them gotcha. uh, the idea kind of came from just i mean just always like helping people being in the outdoors um always been a big part of my life and 
I've done okay as a hunter. I was satisfied as a hunter a long time ago. And I just always like taking the people that just need a little help or a little guidance or another set of eyeballs or someone to keep them motivated and, and, and get it done. And we moved over here seven years ago. And first thing Deanna and I, our founder and my wife did was uh, ask the homeowners if we could walk the property. And they were kind of confused and they said, absolutely. And two hours later, after leaving our realtor here, we got back down and, and we took a realtor aside and say, we want to make an offer. And uh, it's such a special place. I mean, we have so much diversity with wildlife. We have turkeys, and coyotes, and elk, and mule deer, and whitetail, and grouse, and bears, and mountain lions, and pretty much everything the man upstairs put on this side of the mountain we have. And we just wanted to share it with the right people. And we hosted a hunt and posted some pictures up. And next thing you know, it's like we better become a nonprofit. And that's kind of how it all started. That's pretty cool. I, so I, I'm really interested in in your property um, because you know I anybody that listens to the show know, knows that you know my wife and I we bought 26 acres of bare land in in the in the woods of uh, North Idaho here. We, we've lived in North Idaho a long time, but uh, we we sold our place that was just outside of town uh, a year ago and moved out here. Closest neighbor is about a mile away. Uh, and you you named all the wildlife uh, that that is very similar to my property. So, can you do you mind sharing a little bit about your property? Like what what uh, geographically you're in north? I don't want to give that information too you know too much away, but northeast um, Oregon. And uh, tell us a little bit about your property. Like what what how how big is your property? What what was the goal with the property? Is it was it did you buy it to to hunt the land or you work in the land or I, I'm just that kind of stuff really interests me. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's pretty easy answers. Um, uh, we have 98 acres. Oh, nice. The lower 18 is pasture and a big pond. Got some catfish in it. Got a horse born down there in it. Um, well, that's not true. Not the lower 18. Well, I guess, yeah, it does. It's kind of like split up. We have 18 from the house down. Below our house, we have about five acres fence with a horse barn with water where we can keep them in the winter. Uh-huh. Uh, we let them out as soon as spring fever hits uh, down into the lower pasture, which I'm guessing is probably 12 to 14 acres with a big pond where they can drink and, and eat. Then we move them back up in the winter. But behind the house, we have 80 acres. And it's really narrow and it's okay if people know it's on our facebook page it's on our address is on our website yeah everyone has onyx maps and and uh we've dealt with plenty of trespassers in the past so everybody knows where we're at so that's we, that's okay with us i mean it's no secret so um the back 80 starts off on a gradual incline i told you I think i told you earlier the house is at thir- right around 38 20 or something and mm-hmm. my my upper tree stand on the third upper bench is at uh, 4450. Oh, so there's so, there's quite an elevation gain on your property. Yeah, and yeah. it's real narrow. I mean, I'm guessing maybe 400 yards wide, but, but we go back a mile. Oh, wow. Yeah. The nice thing about that skinny little piece of dirt is it's got three benches on it, and we all know what lives on benches and plays <laughs> on for bit and what breeds on benches and what sleeps on benches. You betcha. And, and that's wildlife. So um, as you go up, to the upper property it's kind of a big open meadow in the middle with a heavy heavy pine forest on each side that takes up i don't know 15 acres or so and then it kind of flattens off to the first bench and it gets a little thicker here and there and Mm -hmm. then it starts to go through an area we call the gauntlet we call it the gauntlet because that's where that's where we got pictures of a lot of guests with a mountain lion standing right behind them on a game camera um Yeah, we got a big mountain lion problem, but we're working on that. Um, and then it starts to go through the gauntlet about 400 yards, and then it goes uphill for, I don't know, 600 feet, 500 feet, uh, pretty much not vertical, but in a very short distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, the gauntlet's thick like the Oregon coast, but we don't have the ferns. You can't see five feet either side of the road I cut. It took me... By the way, it took me a year and a half to hand cut this road before I had a quad with a chainsaw, a gallon of gas, and some snippers. <laughs> did, and, <laughs> so you, you had to put the road in. Uh, how how long did you say you've been there? Five years? Uh, uh, just over six, going on seven. Oh, 
Okay, going on seven. So it took you like over a year to cut that road. I know that's a pain in the butt. Did you have to pull a bunch of stumps and all that? Well, it was an old trail, um, and we did. We cut some trees. We just cut them down to the ground. Every couple of years as the ground sinks, we cut them a little lower. But um, mm-hmm. it was a pretty good deal because after the first couple of years of having veterans and first responders over here, they all wanted to come back and help get the property ready for the for the next hunters that were veterans and first responders. So a couple times uh, a year, they'd come over and they helped us get the road punched through in two days. That would have taken me another month. Yeah. Well, shoot. Yeah. That, that little, yeah. Um, when you're, so are the hunters that you're bringing on? Cause I, I want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and, and then I have another question about your property. So you, you can see how I roll here. We're all over the place. Sorry about that. I'm good with it. I, I'm all <laughs> over the place. I've had a tremendous, brain injury so i'm with you on this <laughs> so with the hunters that you you bring out there are they just hunting your land or do you is does is it like accessible to some public that's uh that's butted up against your property or how does that work no um it works two ways like turkey hunts uh we just hunt our land uh, we do pretty good um we're going to start venturing out to the national forest later we get turkey season's april 15th to may 31st you get after about May 15th, and they're they're not as cooperative, so yeah. you got to get out on some national forest. But the good news is you can leave our house and stay on gravel, and in a half hour be on national forest and never have to hit the pavement or see very many people. So that's beneficial as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah, super beneficial. That's awesome. That's great, now, man. Our elk hunts, yeah, our elk and deer hunts, um, we haven't done a lot of deer hunts. We've done a couple, um, some special ones that were pretty good, um, premium tag, but uh, – our elk hunts, we, we can't. We started, we had archery hunts here that um, were 0 for 3, and I mean 0 for 3 because three bulls should have, three bulls should have been harvested, but it's understandable. Um, but since they made Oregon a draw for archery, elk, and deer, deer last year and elk this year, um, we harvest the majority of our bulls regardless on, on National Forest. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing um, with – how I, I don't know the mentality of it like i have elk on my property uh and and it's not it's not almost 100 acres like yours it's it's but i've i'm butted up against some very particular land against the you know clark fork river where um people can access it but it's a pain in the butt so they don't so we like have all this access to this other land over here you know and and so that part's cool uh but i i don't have a huge desire to hunt elk on the land here right i mean uh let's be honest if there was a 300 class bull bugling his head off walking through my property i'm I, property i'm probably gonna uh, i'm probably gonna clap him but um most of the bulls here on this on, on the property here they're they're smaller um and, and i i don't know it's just i i don't like to hunt here i'd let my girls hunt here uh, but for for me, I, I like to go up on the public land, and so. But again, I don't I don't have the acres that you do. I, oh, that's what I was going to ask you about, um, Ryan. What like you talked about dealing with trespassers? What? How do you deal with that? Like, what? How do you how do you kind of mitigate the trespassing? Well, it's real easy for me now. Um, short history, short story. I had several of them, lots of them, all the time, three or four a year during archery season. Uh-huh. couple couple uh during non-hunting seasons and i would call the sheriff up which we have an amazing relationship with we work with all the governing authorities from day one just so they know what's up um we don't break any rules well the sheriff was had their hands tied where they could pretty much just warn people even if you had a game camera picture well we went to the troopers two and a half years ago senior trooper senior fish and game trooper in in our region and uh We've only had one since then, and they'll never be back. Oh wow! And I think that I think that's a big deal because the troopers don't warn people; they arrest people. And what we do is, we have I run a lot of cameras on our dirt. I have five mobile cameras from Moultrie. That, and that, uh, that's what I was going to ask you. They, they are the cell cam, so you know immediately, right? Well, sometimes it it just depends. Okay. It depends on the. But I usually know within an hour. But is what I do is I send. An onyx waypoint to where that camera is with the picture off that camera, and I send it to the trooper, and I leave it alone, and I walk away. If three or four days later the trooper has any questions or can't find the pe- people, they call me and ask me to do a post, or they call and ask me to help find those people. And last time it took two hours, and the person was calling me. Oh, wow. 
Um, huh. I hate to be that way. I really do. I mean, I just, I wish a knock on the door would, would happen more because mm-hmm. majority and because of our organization and, and us being hunters as well, uh, it's probably going to be a no, but you never know. I mean, if we're done and, and our tags are full and we're not having any guests, it very well could be a yes. Now yeah, I hope yeah. this doesn't get my door to getting beaten down by people, but you know, um, and the other thing is too, people can reach out. Most of them know it, you know, we'll help you any way we can, especially mm-hmm. if you're a vet first responder, I'll send you my onyx waypoints. I'll show you my spots. I'll show you where I'd camp and where I'd hunt for the first three days. And a lot of people used to give me crap about that. And I'd be like, I'd rather run into these guys than some other guy with an attitude out there that I'm going to have to deal with and take away from my hunt. So I have no problem sharing my spot. Yeah, that's a good perspective, actually. I've never thought of it that way. And and I'm I'm with you, Ryan. I I don't want to be a jerk and, like, uh, you know, when it comes to owning – because I've always been – a public land hunter, you know, we live out west, Always, there's always public land, and, but, uh, y- you know, before I was able to even consider affording my own little chunk of, of land that's that's even huntable, um, you know, like when I was in my 20s, that wasn't even a consideration, I didn't think that would ever happen, uh, and I would get frustrated by seeing no trespassing signs here and there, um, or asking a farmer for access, and they'd say no, uh, and so I don't ever want to be like a jerk, but I... I I, I do have that other side of me where it's like, you know, I worked my ass off to achieve this life that that I, I put in my mind as a goal and I worked for it. And now now I own this land uh, and and I, I want my kids to be safe and, and be able to go where they because my girls are wild as all get out, man. They'll they'll be out there picking huckleberries or hunting for mushrooms. And I don't want to be worried about if there's some trespassers and hunters out there being irresponsible with guns. And that has happened once. So it's like this big mixed thing. And so I always like to, especially for somebody like you, you've owned the land a lot longer than I have. Um, and, and you've got a lot more experience with, you know, more acreage and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's good to pick your brain about that. So I appreciate it. Oh yeah. And I, you know, I see it both ways. I mean, I see it the way you, what you never thought you'd have. I mm-hmm. see it the way you say that now that it's yours, you understand, but I don't think it's so much, honestly, that it's just yours or mine right now. I think is the world we live in is completely changed I, I, and, yeah, yeah. and you never know who that person is that you're going to confront face to face. Is it going to be a friendly conversation? Is it going to be, uh, is it going to be, you're going to have to step up and put your foot down or is it going to be confrontational where you're going to have to deal with things quickly and abruptly. And those decisions need to be made fast. And, yeah. And so I would say in today's world, um, you just got to handle it and always be on alert when you, when you deal with someone and always try to be as nice as you can, but you can't believe nothing they say until you verify it. That's, that's yeah. where I'm at. Based. It's the old uh, the old trust but verify philosophy, right? The old songbird will tell you anything he wants to say. <laughs> yeah. That's my that's my experience. <laughs> you know, we so don't always true. prosecute. You know, we don't always prosecute, but you can tell right away. You know, sure, you got onyx. You know, do you have hunt map? Yeah. You know? Well, do you have this? Where do you live? And if they're lying to you about everything right off the get go, I mean, it's real easy for a trespasser to verify his story. Yeah. And if he checks out, and it's an honest mistake. Hey. One time somebody did it and they came and knocked on my door and said, I think I'm on three of your cameras. And I was like disturbed. And how did that happen? And he told me and I was like, you know what? We're done turkey hunting. You and your buddy go have at it for the rest of the day. And we let them hunt back there. They were on it, came to our house. And, and, you know, that's the way it should be. But unfortunately, it's not that way anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. It's because it's not. And and like you said, you never know who the hell's going to end up on your property. But I'm always I'm always willing to. Um, especially if I've got a neighbor or somebody around that, that has a, has a youth hunter, they, and, and they know they're like, we, we get tons of turkeys on our property. You know, I, ironically with that, my, uh, my two girls, I took them out. They both got turkeys this spring and, and none of the turkeys they got were on our land. Even though we had them gobbling all around us, we just could never get one. (laughs) It just never worked out. So anyway, that's just a funny side note. But if I had people... You know whether I know him or not, and they asked, they they, they knew there was a, a tom gobbling his head off, you know, or or whatnot. I and especially a youth hunter, yeah, yeah, go go get him. I'll I'll, yeah. I'll show you the trail. You know, and you got to lay down you got to lay down the rules though right away. Like don't shoot this direction. There's yeah, a exactly. Up. Yeah. Shoot that way. Don't cross any fences. Especially you because you, you've got the horse uh, down in the pasture there. Um, that's that's going to be unnerving sometimes. 
Uh, during rifle season, a lot of people drive the gravel roads because we're back by the mountains, but it's mm. all farm down in front, egg fields. And oh, gotcha. Believe it or not, one, one time we had a rig go by where my middle boy was here visited, and we were stacking firewood, and we watched this joker. I don't know. He's 400 yards away. He gets out of his truck. The truck stops. He gets out of the passenger door, climbs the fence, pulls his gun up. <laughs> he can hear me Whoa. talking to him or seen anybody run so fast <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, but, but regardless that one was just left alone and i think they figured it out and they've never been back it's just it's more about safety than anything yeah yeah that's what I, I think a lot of people don't understand too um you know so I, I think a lot of hunters look at it like oh what's the harm uh if i if i go shoot a deer on on their property they're not going to miss it or, or, or whatever they won't even know kind of thing but they you know you just never know the trajectory of these where a round could go, where your kids could be in the woods playing, um, you know, so it, it's a, it's definitely a touchy subject. But uh, anyway, Ryan, I, I want I, what's what I'm super curious about is the mission of High Timber Dreams as a as a nonprofit. Uh, why veterans? How did how did you grow up? How did you come to where you're at now, where you've got this uh, almost like a calling? Where you wanna you wanna serve others that are first responders, veterans, people uh, that that serve the communities uh, in our country, and where did that come from? It kind of just happened on its own. I mean, I, I'm a U.S. Army veteran, 11 Bravo veteran. My oh, wife, she 11 B. Yes, um, my wife is a, a nurse, director of nursing for um, in-home healthcare in three counties, and. She's a volunteer firefighter, and she's in school right now getting her master's to become a nurse practitioner. And, oh, cool. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been in some bad spots, and I'm not talking about anything to do with when I was in the military, but I've been in some bad spots because the world's a mean place. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been in dark spots, and I think my wife and I have a good enough relationship considering we're best friends as well that she recognized that I needed something to – needed something to take the anger and the violent tendencies away. And she said, well, let's, you know, let's do some hunts. I kind of brought it up. We got, we're done hunting. Let's get, let's get a veteran out here. You know, who else would be out here? And we weren't even going to be a nonprofit. And as much as I disliked people, I mean, despise people, to be honest with you, the thing that helped me the very most, ever in my whole world besides meeting my wife and having my children was helping other people. And I would have never thought that. Man. Believe me, I've would been the first guy to say, I ain't helping nobody. Yeah. And then, <laughs> but nothing was working. It's like calling elk. I tell people all the time, they, 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 they're not harvesting elk. They're not calling bulls in. They don't like their beautiful. We'll try something different. Yeah. And the odds are, if you try something different, you'll learn lessons from it that will make you more successful. And that's exactly why we went into high timber dreams. And the reason we picked the criteria is because not only our status as veterans and first responders, but people that help community, people that help others, people that are always out there not having any time to watch their kids grow up or spend time with their families and miss birthday parties and defend our country and defend our cities and put your fires out help you when you go to the doctor who who better who in our opinion they're at the top of our list so we prioritize them i guess is what i'm trying to say i i want to touch on a couple of things you said there um for well first of all clarification for you listeners out there uh that that don't know what 11 bravo is uh that that is a basically an mos code well, I don't know. So that's Army. So in the Army, it would be 11B. And what that means is Ryan was an infantry, uh, whether rifleman, machine gun. I don't know how you guys break that down in the Army, Ryan. I, I was in the Marines, and that, that the 11 Bravo is, uh, you know, basically a synonym for the Marine Corps 0311, where we're, we're ground pounding grunts, right? Uh, do you need? Do you want to clarify anything with that? No, I was ground pounder. I was non-mechanized light infantry unit out of Fort Ord, California, and uh, I rode in a Humvee once. Oh, I rode really? in more helicopters than I rode in Humvees. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. I uh, I didn't ride in many Humvees. You, you know that. You know what's weird? Side totally side story here. I I was a I was a ground pounding grunt that never touched a Humvee, and then randomly they're like, "Hey, uh, Huntsman, you're going to Humvee driving school." 
uh, certification school or whatever they call it. So I go spend four days at this school driving Humvees and getting the certification for it. And it was one of two times I saw bears in North Carolina. I was stationed out at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And they're they're having us drive these Hummers, these Humvees with night vision goggles. Because you know how it messes up with your perception. It's like uh, like the saying in the mirror, objects are closer than they appear kind of thing. So you yes. have to learn how to drive with these these night vision. And, and uh, I was at the front of the line and saw these three bears run across the road in front of me at like 3 o'clock in the morning. Super cool. Anyway, got a, got a certification to drive a Humvee. And then like two years go by, and I drove one at a training in California we were on. Got that sucker airborne uh, <laughs> with the colonel right behind me in a different Humvee. And uh, that was it. That's the only time I've touched him. So, um I, I see I, again. See how I go. You you say one thing, and I go down some uh, random story about seeing bears driving Humvees and getting one airborne. Sorry about that, but <laughs> so no. Hey, that's a great story. I could hear those. I mean, that's one of the other things about what you know. I don't know if I told you this, but <clears throat> we room and board everybody inside our home. Oh wow. Um, okay, I didn't know that. Even even elk hunters may not stay here much because we set up camps in the big three, but, uh, mm-hmm. this is home base. We're about 25 miles from camp. We can, uh, we have a walk-in cooler. We have freezers for capes, coolers to hang the meat. We, uh, we come here and we shower. Mama gives us, you know, boxes of pre- of cookies and brownies and pies that she's made and more dinners that are ready to go to camp. And every four, five day, every four or five days we'll come home and we'll all take our boots off and we'll shower and we'll do our laundry and some code blue and, and uh, have a nice snack, and and then head right back out for the evening hunt. Man, that sounds fantastic. I'll be there in about two weeks. Um, save me a spot. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> in fact, September 14th, I'm setting up camp, and then September 16th, I have a Army Ranger combat veteran who now is an active duty police officer, and I have a combat tanker that we were fortunate enough to get nonprofit statewide elk takes for. Oh wow, well, that's that's what I was going to ask you because aren't those the those units are pretty tough to get tags for, aren't they? Yeah, Winaha gives forty rifle tags and forty archery tags for big bulls um, every year, twenty to twenty five year draw. Mount Emily, where we spend most of our time, this year they get fifty six. Max will be sixty, but fifty six uh, archery, fifty six rifle, and. Um, it takes about 18 to 20 years to draw. Now, now I've ran into guys and called in guys and talked to guys that have had zero points is a good chance because you go into 25% pool. Mm-hmm. Um, guys with six points, eight points, 10 points. Well, I mean, those are guys with the luck of the draw, but the majority of the guys have been waiting, waiting a long time. And the older we get, the, 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 the best chance you got to draw on that twice is if, if I draw it next year, with zero points the year after is my best chance to draw it twice. Because, like I said, you go into the 25% pool if you have zero points. Wow. Gosh, so it's kind crazy. of a it's kind of a crazy and you know and you know having these tags you, these guys these guys deserve the opportunities but you know there's controversy on both sides you know like it's just like guides in Oregon outfitters everyone yeah. thinks well I would say the majority I can't say everybody but the majority of common folk like us think that if you have a guide license in oregon you can just guide wherever you want well that's not how it works you are designated to certain areas that you're allowed to guide in and there are very few guides and outfitters in the areas that we're hunting these guys in if you're anything like me you're always looking for ways to improve your elk hunting skills for september And one of my favorite ways is the Elk Collective. It's an absolute game changer in self-education. This virtual elk hunting course has over 150 videos that cover everything from elk calling, strategy, tips, setup, gear, much, much more. There's a bunch of people involved. Some of the best elk hunters in the woods are involved with the Elk Collective. And they've come together to put together this virtual course to help you notch more tags in September. So check it out at theelkcollective.com and use promo code, all one word, the Western Huntsman, for 20 bucks off the entire course. That makes the course only $69. It's a great deal. And I promise if you go through this course, you will go into the Elk Woods with a lot more confidence and a much better chance at notching a tag on the mighty Wap. Hoffman Boots. 
is the boot choice of the Western Huntsman podcast, and it has been for a very long time. I love my Hoffman in the Explorers, in the 6-inch or the 8-inch. Uh, they have all sorts of options for you to check out. Hoffman Boots is my go-to boot because I am a firm believer that when it comes to gear, the one piece of gear you don't want to skip on is boots. Get really good boots. And if you choose to do some Hoffman boots, you're going to find out why I highly recommend these hunting boots. Made by a multi-generational family of shoemakers, these boots are made right here in North Idaho, and I've got an excellent deal for you if you choose to go with Hoffman boots. Use promo code all caps lock Huntsman 10 for 10% off. Get you some of these boots and find out why I love them. Uh, they're totally waterproof. They're going to give you great traction on the mountain. They're super comfortable. There's very little break-in period. Can't recommend hopping boots enough. Check it out, guys. Next on the list is Scree Gear. High-octane hunting attire without breaking the bank. You want to go into the field with good camo, right? You want you want camo that works, that'll keep you dry, that'll keep you comfortable. You want layering systems, the merino wool, the rain gear, all the things that make hunting a little bit easier and allows you to stay in the field a lot longer. The problem with most of it is it's super expensive, not with Scree Gear. Scree Gear will give you all the high-end technical gear that you want without having to take out a second mortgage, and that's why I like it. And to make it even better, got a promo code, the Western Huntsman, all one word, and that will give you 15% off and free shipping. It's a heck of a deal, guys. I recommend checking out like their bundle packages. They have like the elk bundle or the whitetail bundle or the turkey bundle. All those bundles come with multiple pieces of gear, and you won't regret getting this gear. It's great stuff. Check out Scree at ScreeGear.com. Oh, and you want to call in an elk? Use Phelps Game Calls. I've been using Phelps Game Calls since uh, just about the beginning of Phelps Game Calls. It's a great company story, too. This company started in a little garage and is now one of the premier call companies on uh, within the industry. I mean, you can't you can't go wrong with Phelps Game Calls, whether it's turkey calls, predator calls, waterfowl, or especially I think the bread and butter is the elk calls. And I, I use the Maverick. I use the Pink. I use the Gray Amp. Uh, Check out the AMP series. If you're new to calling, I recommend getting a couple of different ones and trying them out. Find out which one works best for you. But uh, I promise you I'm not steering you wrong when it comes to Phelps Game Calls. It's a great company full of great people that make excellent products that actually work. And the proof is in the pudding. Call in a lot of elk, and you will too if you trust me, by going to phelpsgamecalls.com. I got to obviously, I got a promo code for you, right? Huntsman 10. Huntsman 10 for 10% off your Phelps Game Calls and check them out. Phelps Game Calls. Get them close. Two last items. Check out the Reveal Cell Cams from Tacticam. Whether it is for hunting or security, these are excellent cell cams that I have all over my property. To include, I, uh, I put them on some job sites for some security so people I know if, uh, if they're still in materials or whatever, I'm going to catch them. Uh, and another little promo code I like to throw out there is for Batum907 for anybody that is hunting bears spring or fall and you are allowed to bait. Don't forget to go to Batum907.com. Since made in Alaska, use promo code Huntsman10 for 10% off. The stuff works, and it works well. Let's get back to the show. Here we go. So that, that begs the question, Ryan. Uh, veterans listening to this. How how do they go about being selected to come and hunt with you? Well, as far as our turkey hunts, those are random draw or the, the our first turkey hunt of the year, believe it or not, is a uh, is what we call our donation hunt. We only do one a year, and it's for the first weekend, opening weekend of turkey season. So that April fifteenth. Yep, and and our sponsors, we have amazing product sponsors and financial both sponsors some are the same some do products some do financial but majority do both and every one of our guests leaves with a gear bag and they leave with a gear bag for turkey they get a turkey gear bag outdoor gear bag they get you know those 700 to a thousand dollar gear bags um our elk hunters leave with uh, 1300 to two thousand dollar gear bags and actually this year veterans united home loans which i'm sure you've heard of yep um they're actually paying for our big three tag taxidermy this year. Um, wow. Cause we actually have a Vietnam veteran from Elgin that we got a statewide buck tag for. So he's our third statewide tag. And uh, so the Turkey hunts are random. We put them on our social media. Um, we put them on our Facebook page and we tell people on Instagram to go on our Facebook page and 
just follow simple criteria like follow, share, tag somebody's whatever. Um, and we randomly draw those honestly, randomly draw or pull them out of a bag live or live or whatever we have to do to, yeah. uh, to get that draw done. Um, or elk and deer hunts. I've been working on getting these tags for four years and this year it finally happened and we had to pick immediately and we knew individuals that are huge, make huge sacrifices to benefit their communities, which are veterans as well and, or, and first responders. Yeah. And first responders. And so yeah. we, we randomly chose those people cause we had one day to choose. Um, but this year, uh, mid to end of November, we're going to have an application process on our website, which if you don't mind is heightimberdreams.com. Um, it's not up there yet, but we will have an application process um, for deer and elk. Um, will will you – w- w- sorry to cut you off there, Ryan. W- That's okay. When it gets close to that and that is live, the application, will you will you let me know and so I can I can help plug that for you? Oh, uh, absolutely. And get the word out? Absolutely. Okay. And uh, I don't know if I told you this, but – you know, we're not the nonprofit that's going to just do event after event after event. We are trying to make every hunt a lifetime opportunity, regardless of the species. And we are limiting ourselves to 15 max per season. I per, per season. I personally guided 14 hunts last year, and I usually just take off one month. But last year I took off three, and I'm 54 years old now, so um, 14 is a lot for me. Mm-hmm. Um but at the same time, we'd rather do just 15 opportunities, whereas uh, we can provide everything. Right now, we provide everything except for travel and tags and a weapon. And our goal next year is to be able to reimburse for travel or pay for it up front and buy your buy your tag. So on that note, I'm still confused as as to – I mean, I get the, like the turkey tag. Uh, but being a 501c, uh, being a nonprofit, you – if I'm if I'm understanding this right, you can go to the state and apply for like archery elk tag on you know Mount Emily or, or whatever, and they will allot a certain amount to you to award to a veteran. Or does this veteran have to build up points or get lucky in the 25% with zero points? Well, double-edged sword question, Jim. So, so I, I, um, I, I apologize you, about that. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, my answer is going to be double-edged. Okay. Uh, okay. First of all, it took so long and hundreds of hours of my life and time. I'd rather not talk about the beginning of the process that you mentioned. Okay, no Uh, problem. But as far as the qualifications, if they are a veteran with any service-connected disability percentage, Uh a combat veteran, or a veteran with a Purple Heart, resident or non-resident, they qualify to fill out the application. And on our, they, they fill they fill the they fill, they'll fill it out on our website. They can't okay. they can't just go fill it out on their own. It has to go through a a five hundred one c three nonprofit that meets the criteria required to apply for the application through the nonprofit. Okay, makes sense. So it, there's a lot to it, and to be honest, it took a lot of time to get to where we are. And and no disrespect to the other nonprofits or anybody listening out there, but. Uh, not given any information on this one. <laughs> no, I, I totally get that, and 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 you know, pardon my my ignorance with it. And I think that one one of the things that I've always struggled with with stuff like this is I've I've always wondered about how some of that works, but I've never wondered enough because I I, I just felt like it was never going to be a reality for me to get a tag like that, right? Where where you go and apply and you get accepted or whatever. And so it's it's always been this thing where I just haven't really looked into it because I just thought, you know what? Where I live, I'll just go get my over-the-counter tag. I know where the elk are. I know where the deer are, you know, and 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 go after them. Uh, not saying I'm I'm uh, successful all the time, but uh, at least I could find them. And so uh, I, that's the point, because I I'm aware of I'm vaguely aware of how some of those tags can be uh, handed out, uh, but I don't know what the process is. And and but yeah, I totally understand your side of it too. So um, I think it's I think it's great. Is there when when people are doing that, do you guys specifically have criteria that you're looking for in either a first responder or a veteran? We do, actually. Um, in fact, we, we've tried to hold this. Let's see. We started. We got our 501c3 July of 2018, and we didn't know nothing about nonprofits. We didn't know there was a thousand veteran non-hunting nonprofits out there, mm-hmm. which is which is great news. 
um, we just kind of did our own thing. And then we started paying a little more attention and uh, we realized kind of how things work differently for everybody. And one of our biggest criteria for the past two years, which will probably be criteria forever, which will be on the application on our website for these big hunts is one of the questions is going to be how many nonprofit hunts have you gone on? And I know that may seem a little callous, but we like the we like the individuals that are out there trying every year, uh, never give up, getting other people involved, getting their kids involved, getting their family involved, never complaining, never harvesting all the time, and 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 never complaining and trying. And we like to give those guys the first opportunities with resources. That's the whole idea behind the gear bag. We give them on yeah. turkey decoys. We give them. We give them turkey hunting gear. We give them survival gear. We give them hunting gear. A lot of these guys take that gear that may not be able to afford it or can, and they, they take it and they pass it on to somebody else, or they take somebody else out, and then they start their own little hunting kind of group. And that's a big deal to us. Obviously, we the strength in numbers for hunters, which you know better than anybody, is crucial. So Absolutely. Uh, one of our criteria is if you've been on a whole bunch of hunts with other veteran nonprofits, you're not going to be selected at our nonprofit. Well, and that's that's fair because for anybody out there listening that that might be shaking their head at that, understand that you know I I think about I I've got uh, a couple of buddies that um, when they were they were my new Marines as uh, as we got back from Iraq, uh, they they went back to Iraq like three times after I got out right, and and I actually had these guys on for a Memorial Day special. Um, but these guys are are the they were they were in so many combat environments that they are the type of people that I don't know how to it's a really hard thing to explain because I I don't want to irk anybody <laughs> you know what I mean I do but but th- let me put it this way I feel like they would be very deserving not that I'm advocating for them because I, I, that that's not what I'm getting at but what I am getting at is there's there's a lot of people that will never have the opportunity to hunt elk like I'll give you an example one of those guys I'm talking about lives in in Maine um, he's not gonna they don't he's not gonna have an opportunity to hunt elk right I mean he he's not a fully committed hunter that would put in points for you know montana or wyoming or come to idaho or colorado and get an over-the-counter tag it's just not in their wheelhouse the money's not there that kind of stuff um but it would be a great thing for him so i don't really know where i'm going at this ryan i keep losing my train of thought here's where you're going you need to you need to have him sign up on our web page or or at least even follow our web page or one of our pages probably probably website or Facebook because there's opportunities and you know, we don't ever have anybody calling us, telling us to, you should, you should have this guy hunt. Uh, we don't have that issue. We, we, a lot of them, Turkey hunts are random. We put your, if you, you know, here's, here's the other thing, Jim, I might as well say this while we're talking since people are going to hear this is it's really easy to follow the rules. If a guy, if an organization does a post on, on Facebook and they say, like the post, follow our page, uh, share this post, and tag four buddies and put your your uh, branch of service in the same comment, that's pretty simple, right? Sure. Well, let me tell you something. 30% of the people do it right. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> and and it, may seem, it may seem callous, but if you don't do every step, we can't include you in the drawing. Yeah. Because it's just too simple, which means you just want – to blow through and get something for free and does it really mean that much to you mm-hmm. and I, I then, like i said it may seem callous but those little details um are very important to our organization on 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 who gets to come do hunts but like i said there you turkey go. Hunter yeah. random, you know yeah well yeah and and that's the point i was trying to get before my mind got sidetracked there the point i was trying to make is there are a lot more veterans and first responders out there, then there are hunting opportunities like this, right? And so to cycle the same hunter through every few years and, and the same hunter or, uh, you know, veteran or first responder gets this hunt isn't fair to the other hunters that, uh, that, that you know, would love to do it and just won't have the opportunity. I, I think that that's what I was trying to emphasize there when I when I lost track. Um, so so that that makes sense. And, and I, I love... 
I love the idea behind it. I love the process, the how you guys, the the hospital, the hospitality side that you guys bring them into your home, or uh, you, you know, like you said, you're 25 miles from camp, uh, you, but you have this home base where you can uh, get a little R and R for a day or two, and then go back out. Uh, what kind of, I guess, well, like when you're out uh, out at camp? Do, oh, that's what I was going to ask you, Ryan. Do, do you have to have like a guide license for this, or is is it just all through the nonprofit? Actually, um, I'm glad you asked that because I get questioned that a lot. Yeah. And uh, and uh, remind me to get back to my truck after I'm done telling you this. If okay. You don't mind. Yeah, um, yeah. When before we applied, we became a nonprofit in the state of Oregon, a corporation, nonprofit corporation, of state of Oregon, which expedited our 501c3. So if that benefits anybody, your your state Department of Justice is the one that that governs all your financial and asset information for the federal government. So you definitely want to get your state 501 corporation before you apply for your 501 and it will save you six months. So I hope that helps somebody. Um, when we were in the application process, I went to the city of Elgin. They couldn't help me. They said, I need nothing. I went to union County, the County we live in. I went to the sheriffs. I went to city hall. I went to the state troopers. I went to the VA. I went to the the Grand City Police. I went to every single person I could and told them what we were going to do, um, regardless if we had approval from them or not. We knew it was legal and legitimate, and we were going to do it. And we wanted to make them aware of it, so that when get we've had guests from Alaska, active duty fly from Alaska. We've had firemen drive from Texas. We've had turkey hunters come in from North Carolina. So we get a random people from all over the United States. Wow. And we we did not want a phone call or a misconception of what we were doing to interfere with any time given to the guests that traveled here. Mm-hmm. Because I you know, like I say, I try to buy three seconds on every elk hunt. If I could get three more seconds on every elk elk hunt, probably twenty percent more bulls would be expired. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> we right? all want so, that though. <laughs> right? Yeah. So um so um Back to the truck. My truck's very simple with all of our sponsors. I only have High Timber Dreams on each bedside, High Timber Dreams, Elgin, Oregon on the back. I have an Onyx decal, a canine Molly decal, which is our local Union County canine. And I have Grunt Style on both my back doors on the crew cab because they're one of our biggest supporters. Um, hmm. I actually met with the trooper years ago, and he's like, uh, we should probably notify the outfitters and I want you to call the state Marine board. So I called the state Marine board, which is, you know, people think fishing guide. Well, if the state Marine board governs all guides and outfitters, regardless of the species in Oregon. Okay. And so I'm completely cleared with the state Marine board because I do not take a tip. I do not take a penny. I mean, we pay for the fuel in our trucks. We pay for all the food. We guide for free. I'm the, I'm the ranch manager. I'm the treasurer. I'm the head donation coordinator. I am the outfitter and the guide. I guide every hunt. Now, be and honest. So, are, are you the dog feeder too? Yes, I have. Yes, I'm okay. the dog feeder. I knew it. I do the. I knew it. I do the dishes. I did the laundry today. My <laughs> wife. Uh, my wife has allowed allowed me to be temporary unemployed for years to build this organization, and I'm actually back to work part time cutting meat at the local butcher shop. But, oh, cool. um, but. Um, that's kind of how it works. Yes, I'm cleared. You can say it all you want. People don't believe you, but we don't break no rules. We, we just don't. So, and, and that's always good. If you've caught flat for flack for that in the past, that's, I, I like to clarify things like that. So you're, you're not taking money from these individuals that are hunting, which negates you from the necessity of having like a guide or outfitting license. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? It is. And I've okay. had guys try to get me and I've had guys try to give me gear and I, I absolutely refuse to take it when, when you come to High Timber Dreams Hunt, or you're on our staff, or anything we do, it's not about us. It's about you, and that's why we're trying to pay for the fuel and the and the tags because, I mean, it's a zero zero stress, zero financial obligation. I mean, how many guys can't afford to drive over here? Well, we want to we want to cover that. We yeah. get we get hunters all the time that want to hunt. Where's the closest motel? We're like, for what? And they're like. Because we got a station where I said, yeah, we got three extra bedrooms. You're living with us, huh. you know, and, and believe it or not, with the veterans first responder, that's that's it's been a blessing to us because 
when they all leave, they leave his family. I mean, yeah, they all stay in touch. They all tell their buddies about us. They all get involved in projects that we're doing. And I mean, that that help is something I may not notice all the time, but it's greatly appreciated. I'm I'm yeah, I'm just. I'm really thrilled about this. I, I had no idea that this is what it was. I knew that you were a, a, a nonprofit veteran organization focused on taking folks out uh, hunting. So, I, but I, I didn't know the details like this. So, um, how? So obviously, you you said the hunters can't give you anything. They're not going to donate. They're not going to or pay you. They're not going to give you gear. Uh, you turn all that down. But how can people like me help? Or some of the listeners out there help. Uh, is there is this by donation? Is there another way financially that people can help? How how does that work? Well, for the first part of your question, um, we have had a couple hunters. I, I don't know. We've had probably forty or fifty. Um, they've they've gotten to our donation raffle to win a hunt, or they've donated. You know, they bought a hat that we we sell for 30 bucks to send to active duty soldiers around the world that they don't know they're getting to let them know we're we're thinking about them back home. (laughs) Some of them had donated a hundred bucks, maybe once. Um, There have been some a year after they left, like the next hunt we were doing and donated to help that veteran. Um, But the time of the hunt, I don't, I don't want to miscrew this, but that's the truth. And at the time of the hunt, they're not paying to come here. They're not paying for success. They're not paying for absolutely anything. The only thing we ask hunters to bring besides their gear and their weapon is a, and, the, and their tag, if we're not providing it, is bring your favorite snack because we're going to have, you're going to leave, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to leave fatter than you were when you uh, got here, regardless for an elk oh, camp or a man. Okay. Tell me about that. What kind of food are we talking about? <laughs> uh, we go out to dinner once a month. So we eat, well, I just got done eating uh hog short ribs that my wife had in the crock pot for nine hours uh, i killed two bears already this year so we've been eating bear sausage i made and we had bear roast and we had a guest a gunny sergeant come here with uh command sergeant major rick Stat. we put them two together they'd known each other for for years but never met so we hosted both them on a turkey hunt they both got both got their first turkeys and gunny nice. lives down on the Oregon coast and he brought a he brought a whole bunch of cod fillets so we've been enjoying some cod um we eat a lot of elk and deer uh, we we eat good you come to camp or to the house you're going to eat what we, eat. we we don't really cater the menu to our guests we ask everybody when we know that they've they've been awarded to hunt uh food likes food dislikes food allergies medical conditions we need to be aware of medications contact numbers um uh, if there's something on on your on your I do not like or eat, it won't even be in your face while you're here. We'll we'll, we'll work around that because we have a big variety of meals. But yeah. mama's a home. Mama uses her grandma's cook. She's mastered her grandma's cookbook. If if that helps any. <laughs> no, it it paints it paints the perfect picture. But it begs the question, Ryan. What about what do you offer as far as a vegan menu? Whatever, whatever. <laughs> if they want to go all vegan, we'll, we won't serve me. No, well, I'm, I'm not serving yeah. you no. Know, I'm not serving you no plant-based whoppers, <laughs> but uh, I'll fill you up on vegetables. A plant-based whopper. <laughs> I'm not 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 serving any of that fake meat, but I'll fill you up on uh, on uh, you know pastas and well, there's a difference between being a uh, I, what do they call it? There's two. There's a vegan and there's there's you have like piscatarian, which they'll eat seafood uh, and fish, and then you have vegan. Which is basically like no animal products, and then you, you have like vegetarians who will, uh, you know, they'll eat things like eggs and cheese, but not red meat or something. I and I'm I'm probably missing it a little bit here, but that's kind of well, my understanding of it. Well, red flag, real quick. If you awarded a hunt and, and I ask you what your food dislikes and likes are, and you don't eat red meat, you probably shouldn't be coming here to hunt. <laughs> I, I guess that's the best way to simplify I that. I feel like there'd be some. You know, ulterior motives there. If somebody was, uh, that that was the goal there. Do you guys, uh, do you guys do bear hunts for this? Or I haven't heard you mention bear hunts other than you said that you've gotten your two bears. We really want to do predator hunts. We have as many bears and lions as anybody. I mean, I've seen 15 bears this year already. Um, I've only had one. I've the last lion. I was over in Wyoming for three weeks helping a buddy, mm-hmm. old timer, build his house, helping him out, and. Uh, we had lions here five five out of nine days, and uh, it's really really hard for us to do lion and bear hunts because to get somebody all the way over here, when you get a lion or bear around, bear will stick around. You can kind of pattern the bears. 
Yeah. You know, they'll, they'll come in same path. They'll follow the elk and the deer, whatnot. And the, the bigger ones will just wipe everything off the planet of the earth in their path and look for something dead. But the lions, they may be here for a day. They may be here for four days. If there's one lion, he's going to be in and out for a day. If there's two lions, he'll be here for two or three days. If there's four lions, there was four lions when I shot the lion last year. Mm-hmm. And after I shot it at 24 yards, two others came out 10 yards from that. Um, wow. But there was four. I got pictures of the four. They were here six days killing deer, and I got pictures of them leaping on deer. But <laughs> it's really, really hard to put a post up, find a hunter, have them – get the day off of work if it's not a weekend and drive all the way over here and waste that resources on fuel and, and everything else to not even know if there's really a lion here. Cause to be honest with you, when we kill lions, they come hard and fast. You hit that call. I mean, the first one I shot was shot within three minutes, 19 yards. The second one I shot was harvested in five minutes, maybe four minutes of turning on the call. Huh? And, and also, what kind of call are you using for that, Ryan? I use a Fox Pro. Fox Pro? Um, okay. I, I use a diaphragm um, for calf elk distress to change it up. Uh, sitting up in a tree, we, we, we tree stand hunt predators because the upper bench where the tree stands are. Um, we have some on the lower bench, middle bench, but the upper bench, you can't see through it. Like I said, it's like the Oregon coast without ferns, and I actually cut a V pattern that starts at five yards and goes out to 30 yards wide, and the farthest shot you get with the bow is 41 huh. yards. The farthest shot with a rifle is 51 yards, so I created a funnel. And I put a water trough up there. And I'll be honest with you, you and I can talk after this after this <laughs> podcast. I know some really good stuff. I mean, I used to share everything that I use mineral wise, and pretty soon all my neighbors are using it, and the elk are still here, but not as much as they were because yeah. my neighbors put some pictures chewing on it. Mm. Uh, yeah. I got some really good stuff I use out of Utah now, and um, more than anything, they hit the water. In but, it, how how late into the year does the the water? Because you guys can't bait bears, right? In, in Oregon, we we can bait deer and elk all year long, but we cannot bait bears or lions. See, isn't that weird? Like in Idaho, we can't we can't bait deer and elk, which well, whatever. I don't I don't really care. Uh, but you can bait bears, uh, and and so it's it's uh, same thing. Like a, I know I I'll tell you a little secret. I have a I have a friend who has property that borders the Washington state line where they can bait. And guess what happens during hunting season on the big bucks that live on his property um you know the the, the month or two before season opens as they are as they are kind of shuffling around, moving around, getting ready for the rut. Well, the the neighbors on the Washington side which you know he can essentially see the house uh, from from the top of his property where on, on the Washington side his neighbor's house, they start baiting and and none of the deer come back over to the Idaho side. Um, I I don't know where I'm I'm not I'm not saying that that's fair or unfair. It's just it's just interesting how different states choose to manage, and it 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 it's mind boggling to me when we have. Bear populations like like the one the, like the population that you're talking about in your neck of the woods sounds like a pretty healthy robust population of bears, but you're not allowed to bait. Um, it, it's just weird. Anyway, uh, well, that, that was my my soapbox. To go with your soapbox, in Oregon you can use electronic calls on bears and lions, but you can't use them on deer and elk. True. Yeah, I I did know that. Isn't that interesting? And 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 technically. I kind of, I guess I kind of misspoke because you know I'm gonna have a hard time putting this out there because people may people may abuse it, which shame on them if they do. But in Oregon, legally, you can bait bears. You just can't hunt over oh, bait, and gotcha. you cannot you cannot hunt over a baited site until all the bait has been 100% completely removed for 14 days. And I mean, just like DEQ showing up at your house on a bad septic, you better clean it all up, no matter how big <laughs> hole you got to do. I mean, how technical does that have to be when you're when you're talking? If you have a bait site, and then a hundred yards away, you set up a tree stand on a corridor that goes to your bait site, could you get in trouble for that? Absolutely, yes and no. Each trooper that's going to come out here, that's a fish and game trooper, is going to have you know the Oregon trooper laws are discretionary upon the trooper, and but they've heard it all, but. I mean, just as a common folk and a hunter and a conservationist, if you're baiting bears for 300 days a year and you dig up your site and 30 days later, I mean, a bear's nose is 30 times stronger than my pit bull's nose. Yeah. And 
you got intentions of hunting over that site. Shame on you. Uh, they should just change it to absolutely zero putting bait in the woods for bears. Yeah. Yeah. And but there's so many ways to because, cheat that. But but there's controversy because at the same time I say that I respect everybody's beliefs and that's taking away other people's rights that may believe differently. So I have a I'm not I'm not pro or con. I'm just I'm just giving you the statistics and by no means anyone on this podcast, please take my word for it. Before you do anything, you check with your local authority. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's my best advice. If you have a question, you know how many questions you see on Facebook? I, I, I'm on so many groups and, and posts because we, we we grew up on game camera pictures on our on our pages. Mm-hmm. Uh, I see I see questions all the time and I see people beating them up and the good administrators will delete those posts and kick that person off the page or warn them privately. But people just don't know no better. They're, they're, it's not like it was when we were younger. I didn't hunt until I was 25. Mm-hmm. And. It's not like it was back then. Right now, it's it's a resource for organizations like us. It gets more people involved. There's more nonprofits getting youth involved. <clears throat> the people we host, they get more people involved. Yeah. So it's not like you're going to run into 10 guys in the woods. If you can really call a bull elk in in a, in a heavy populated public area that's not a high unit like we're hunting in this year, you got to expect to call in 10 or 25 guys a, a day and and people get mad, but if you sound like an elk, you're going to call in hunters. And if you don't understand that, don't sound like an elk. Yeah, yeah. That's just my personal opinion. No, I uh, there's uh, there's a lot to be said for that. It, it's it's all it, it doesn't mean that you can't be frustrated, but you can't be angry at the other hunter and and call it legitimate. Does does that make sense? Like I 100 percent agree. I've I've called in hunter, hunters. And and I've been called in by a hunter, right? And it is frustrating, but that doesn't mean I I'm mad at that individual um, because, uh, well, I mean I have I have I have messed with some Doug Fluties a couple times, but 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 real quick to cut <laughs> you off to cut you off, uh-huh. I hunted in the wilderness and packed in seven miles one year with my my buddy Jeff that got me into archery hunting, and this is when I was a young buck. And we were chasing big bulls every day. I mean, big bulls. That's the only place I've ever seen a 400-inch bull in my life. And I blew it when I was 26. Um, Missed a four-point a couple days later. And on the last day, my buddy was driving all the way from the west side to come over to Desolation and pack us out. And we heard this. We heard the flutie every single day, every single morning, every single afternoon, every single day. Never left that ridge. We we're like, how the hell is he getting in there? And we found a road. We we're like, okay, he's coming in on this road. We're still miles away down at the bottom of the John Day Wilderness. Uh-huh. This guy's up on a bench about a third of the way down. On the last day, we said we still got a couple hours. Let's go take a look at this flutie and see see who this joker is. And it it was one of the biggest top two bulls I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I love it. And we were like, are you kidding me? We get, we can't even go hunt this bull. We got to get camp broke down because the horses are already on the trail. <laughs> oh, man. <How laughs> I'm telling you, if, 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 it, if it's the worst bugle you ever heard, or check the it best out. You ever heard, you just got to get close enough to get your you, eyes on. You really do. You really do. I mean, I. That's uh, that, I I love hearing stories like that because I I've I've done that where I've I've prejudged a bugle. Oh, that's a little bull, or oh, that's another hunter. Come to find out, I was totally wrong, and you know, and so they catch you off guard. Uh, so that's a that's a pretty good hunting, uh, hot hunting tip from from uh, Ryan here, folks. Uh, if you hear a, a bugle, don't prejudge it. Don't think it's just Doug Flutie for the sake of uh, the the way you hear it or prejudge it. You might want to check it out. Can I add something to that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so last year I had a I had a hunter that had a, the premium tag for one of the big three. Awesome guy, love this guy. Shot a 335 bull, pretty nice. Since the biggest bull he ever shot was a three point. And uh, um, we were walking through the woods, and I was working a couple bulls. And next thing you know, we got nine bulls screaming, and the one bull stays constant. And the elk will tell you everything you need to know. Now, a lot of people think they know elk language, and they do, and I agree with it because. They know what works for them and what their experiences have taught them. So when people say that, you can't say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. That's what works for that person. So you got to appreciate that and listen to them, especially if you're hunting to them. But we're walking through the timber. The herd bull beat up seven bulls. There was only one left to fight besides us. We went quiet for an hour and a half. We got within 100 yards of this bull, and he went and kicked that other bull's ass, and he made a mistake and left his cows behind. 
And as soon as I laid into it, we heard him running. Then we heard a truck start up and come running. But the point of the whole story is, and the bull blew out. We went down there and met a guy with a trad bow. But the the whole point of the story is, is while we were working this bull, um, he made some sounds that only bulls over eight or nine years old could make that most hunters don't understand what those sounds are. Bulls make 14, 15, 16. Some probably make 20 different sounds. Mm -hmm. The older they get the more dinosaur sounds they make. And this bull didn't bugle. He didn't grunt. He didn't growl. He didn't chuckle. He just moaned. And I, I said, that's a herd bull. He looked at me and he goes, I heard that several times in sled springs. That's not a bull. I don't know what it is, but it ain't a bull. I said, you want to put some money on that? And (laughs) sure enough, within an hour, his eyes lit up. He goes, that was a bull. (laughs) So uh, a little, a little tip to the, to the guys. I'm not a know it all. I'm just really good at calling elk and, I pay a lot of attention to them because their trips mean that much to me. But mm-hmm. uh, is if you don't know what it is, it's probably a bull. If you never heard it, it's probably not a lion. It's probably not a coyote. It's probably not a turkey. It's probably not a deer. It's probably not a young bull. It's probably a herd bull. So spend Man. the time. You know, one of the biggest problems I see is guys leave elk to find elk. <laughs> yep. We've you talked know, about that on this show. They see 9, 10, 20, 30 cows. And a, and, a, and a raghorn. Well, big bulls, big herd bulls, everybody knows, I would hope, that they bench up for the first couple of weeks of the rut. They let the 310, 320, 330, 340 pecking order in existence. Mm-hmm. Let them round them up, and he skirts that herd for, you know, 100, 200 yards, wherever he can keep the wind. And Big Daddy knows it's time to rest, and he's going to go down in there after a couple of weeks when he gets that first whiff of estrus, and he's going to kick that bull's ass, and he's going to take them cows. Um, and I truly am a firm believer if that's what the real big 350 plus herd bulls do as they get older in age. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people need to pay more attention. It's like the guys that are really, really good callers. Um, they only make two or three sounds. Learn them all. I mean, best yeah. advice I can give is don't don't leave elk to find elk because if there's 20 cows and a four point in the spike. There's a herd bull around somewhere. If it's in the middle at the end of September or the first week of October, you just got to stay on them and be patient. And one thing I do know is patience kills more big bulls than any other, any other call you'll ever have is patience. When you say patience, are you talking about like when you've called and, and you, you just work that bull slower or are you talking about forget the calls and, and figure out, kind of where he's traveling, where he's moving, and wait till wait to get closer and then start calling. Does that make sense how I'm ask, asking? I, I said it kind of confusingly. No, no, it was perfect, but there's answers to both of them, and the biggest variable is the time of day. Um, they move, you know, in my experience, they move, they're up, they're, they're up all night, and they're moving towards their beds a half hour. Depending on how many cows they have will depend on how many bugles you're going to hear the big bull doing a bull calling a cow Mm -hmm. it's usually a high pitch short with a grunt but i find in my experience when i hear that big bull do a short high pitch short little raspy i mean like three second with a grunt uh, a gur at the end it's a little it's a little one pitch note after the end of that where i know he's trying to round the cows up but the cows are actually going to bed in my belief the cows are the ones going to bed and the bull is so disoriented at that point in the rut that he thinks he's pushing them cows around, but that herd cow swan that's in charge of all the milk, that's just my <laughs> is what I tend to do is I don't chuckle that much. Um, I'll, I'll try to steal the cows from the bull. And you know, the one thing a lot of people, it took me 20 years to understand, I have 15 years to understand that we don't know what happens at night. We're not out there at night. I, I'm yeah. not the guy and throw a hunter and put a pack on and walk for more than a mile. I'll go to 30 spots. Usually can only hit 10 before 11 a.m. And if and within a mile, if there's no bull around in these spots, because I hunt travel corridor spots where there's been big bull seen, spots where there's been big bulls harvested, mm-hmm. spots where the big bulls miss. So there's always going to big be a big bull in that area, regardless. We just don't know what time of year the biggest of the bulls is going to be there. Dep- depends on the you know the moon, the ocean, everything has to do with it. So we jump around and uh, we play that game, but um, you're going to have to go back and reiterate the second part of your story for me. I apologize. Oh, well, I mean, here, here's the thing, Ryan. When, if you get me on this elk topic, you, you're going to have to commit to another hour. Um, 
And uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I, but I do have some questions for you because you said something that I I want I, I want to know what you mean by you be, because you're kind of the second person that I've talked to recently that has implied this. When you're calling to the herd bull, you're not calling to the herd bull. You're calling to the cows to try to steal the cows from that herd bull in an effort to make that herd bull really pissed off to want to come over and kick your ass. Is that what you're saying? Well, is well, that is that what you meant by yeah, that? It is what I meant, but there's so many variables. I mean, I, I know, I know, but that, uh, but, well, but generally, let, let me give you a quick quick run up. If if I can get within a hundred yards of that bull, which usually means I'm silent for at least a half hour. I mean, why call? Yeah, 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 I agree. Why, why call if you don't have to? Um, first of all, we don't know what happened that night. And back to a previous part of this conversation is, then big bulls will let, you know, little reg sixes, fives, fours, three, they'll be all around. He'll let them hang around if he's got enough cows. And they'll all attack them at the same time. He'll teach them all a lesson. But uh, he's not intimidated by them. Yeah. So when he's hung up, when I'm calling and he's hung up, <clears throat> And I know he's trying to round up his cows or he's telling me what he thinks he's trying to do um, by just paying attention to his consistency. Um, I'll walk and I'll get close enough and I'll do calf calls. I'll do more calf calls than anything. And the other thing I'll do is when I hear him tell me to come with a bull calling a cow, we don't we don't never snake. We walk, we run, we move, put the arrow in your quiver, put your safety on, whatever. We break sticks. We let him know we're coming. We stop and hang up. We ask him again. If he tells me again, we move closer again. But once we get in that, you know, you said I could swear on this video, on this uh, audio. So once we get close enough, we call it stepping on his dick. Uh Uh, We get within that 100 yards, we're going to step on it. We're going to step on it hard. And that's the only time I will really challenge a herd bull. Okay. Okay. I'll do a breeding. (laughs) I'll do a. I'll do a. I'll do a breeding sequence. If I can get if I can get within 200 and he doesn't want to play, I'll do a, anywhere from a 30-minute to a one-hour breeding sequence where I start out as just a small herd with just a little hint of estrus and a couple small bulls around. And then I'll walk 100 yards back and break some trees and be the biggest bull, bigger than that bull ever could imagine being that's got those cows I'm trying to steal. And I'll breed them one at a time for – a half hour to an hour and yes i'll use extra odor and whatever i have to do and eventually he'll come in but usually they come in silent very very rarely when i do a breeding sequence will they come in screaming but it does happen but most of the time they're coming to take a look and you understand one thing about the hunts we're doing in these big units it's any weapon and all these guys use rifles so we don't got a bull into 40 yards last year the last bull was shot at 31 yards with a rifle with a 308 bergera so is that is that the is that unit specific or is that because of the veteran tag or whatever? The veteran uh, tag, August first to November thirtieth. Any unit but Indian reservation and watershed, any weapon. Wow, man, that's you a- could use a, you could use a pistol, you could use a muzzle loader, you could use a shotgun with a slug, you can use a bow, or you can use a rifle. You know how many elk I'd, I'd I have have like tagged out by this time in my life if I could use a rifle in September? It's ludicrous, but. Uh, right. Uh, that's that's fantastic. So I I, oh, I I love that phrase too because that's exactly what you're doing. You're stepping on his dick. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, and look, I had to name this close, episode. That's what I had to name we, the episode. <laughs> a lot of a lot of guys and, and power to them, man. I have mad uh-huh. respect. I just wish they would reach out more because when you get within that 200 yard zone, you have to change it up. And when you get within 100 yard zone, quit challenging the bull. You don't want to challenge the bull. He's not going to come. He played all night last night. He's tired. Mm-hmm. He's bedding his cows. He's getting up every 20 minutes and running a circle perimeter, <laughs> rubbing trees and pissing to make sure no other bulls have been in on their cows, like the regs that come in. <clears throat> you got to talk to the cows, and you got to try to convince the cows. Because, I mean, I th- you probably know this, Jim, but uh, I believe that God structured elk, that every bull is structured to fight to the death because they don't want any other bull breeding with any cow, but them yeah, and every, absolutely. and every cow is structured that they only want to be bred by the biggest bull. Yeah, a- absolutely. I, yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. And I, I love diving into this stuff. Um, how, how were you, can you kind of talk about how you're calling to the cow and, and how you're trying to entice the cow in a way that attracts the bull? Does that make sense? Yeah, I'll ignore the bull most of the time when I get close enough. I mean, 
you know, uh, and I think it, I think what I'm going to tell you goes back to the pecking order. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to get off topic, but like the first week of archery. OK, 10 days ago, I had the Army Ranger here with the tag. We went up to a bunch of my spots. We saw bulls and cows in all five spots we went to in Walla Walla, Mount Emily and Winaha. And the second place we went, the first place we saw 120. The second place we went to, Jeez. all I did was a soft cow call after we hiked for an hour, and cows ripped off instantly and started walking towards us, so we left. And, and this was a we, week ago? 10, 10, 15 days ago. And, and just so, just for, for – because this isn't going to be released for a couple of weeks, so we're talking on – what is today, August 23rd? Yeah. I'm talking the 8th or 9th. No, I'm, I'm talking – we're recording this on August 23rd, yes. so if it was 10 yes. days – yeah, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, so – so um we went to the second spot one real soft cow call in a spot that holds big bulls cows started ripping two of them started walking towards us and so we shut up and we walked away we didn't want nothing to do with them it's early the big bulls aren't coming out yet you know we passed on a 340 bull already and that was on day two which was like the i don't know the sixth or seventh but we get down uh, 300 yards away from them we decided to move another couple hundred yards away from him. We had the wind right. I walked up to a tree at the edge of the timber and I started raking a tree with no sounds. Within three seconds, Jason turned around and looked at me and he goes, what's that? I said, he's raking a tree. He's in his bed. And that was a big bull. Um, first week of archery season, I don't even usually call soft cow calls and rake because back to the pecking order, these bulls all know each other. They know how they smell. They know what their tone is per pitch. Mm-hmm. They know what they look like. But if you're the new guy that comes in and you're just raking a tree and you're not making any bull sounds, they get really, really curious. Curiosity kills a lot of elk. Mm-hmm. And so they get real curious and they poke their head out. They'll start rubbing a tree or they'll just walk out or you hear them run in to try to get a look. We never bugle. Now, if we hear bugles, we bugle or cow call mostly. But um, we call that the pecking order. So that leads kind of back in a sense to the breeding sequence. I don't, I only blew a diaphragm bugling for the first time in my life last year. I blow a deep timber sounds. Do you know what that is? No. Dan Clore out of Starkey, Oregon, which is like an hour from here. He created a call years ago and it is a, I kind of Frankenstein his call and he's okay with it. It is a piece of PVC with a medical finger cot rolled down it, cut on a wooden dowel to make elk sounds. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay. And it is absolutely amazing. Um, but back to the whole story that we were talking about is, um, I know we're all over the place, but the elk will tell you everything you need to know and quit trying to challenge the bull. The only time I really chuckle is if I put a bull to bed in the morning and I go back in the afternoon early, I'll, I'll challenge chuckle. No other sounds but a challenge chuckle. And seven out of ten times if he's there, he'll pop off out of instinct with a challenge chuckle, and then we don't even talk again until we get up close to him. All right, Ryan. Here's what we need to do, man. Um, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but I, I do a uh, I do a bonus series called The School of September, and it's all about what we're talking about right now. Uh, and I get, I get really um, – in fact, I get so excited that I, I've gotten a couple of nasty messages lately because I, I get so excited I cut the guest off because uh, I get so many questions going. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to get better at that. But uh, I've kept you over an hour. And so we need to wrap this one up. But I, I, would you come on for uh, next year's series? We, we, we start recording those in like March for a school of September. And, and that's where we spend like an hour or two just going through all this stuff that you're talking about. Elk hunting philosophy, uh, call sequences, uh, call strategies, hunting tips, you, you know, all the things that are kind of centered around this topic. Because it honestly, if if. We didn't have anti-hunters and hostile vegans and and uh, and and all these other folks out there. This is, that, that's all I would talk about. That, that that is all I would talk about is elk hunting, bear hunting, deer hunting, and and tips and tactics and all that kind of stuff. So I, I have to I have to kind of build it up and let it let it come to me when, when, once we kick off the school of September. We've already wrapped them up for this year uh, because by the time this is live, we're already in September, right? And so, um, would you would you be willing to come on for an episode like that? I would. And, and just just so you know, I mean, these are just things that I've learned through hard knocks that really work well for us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I'd be willing to share them with anyone that wants 
I mean, I learned from listening to a little bit of, from learning from hunting with a little bit from everybody and put it all into one package. I tried to learn something from every guest that we have. Yeah. Well, I think the school of hard knocks is, is the best school to learn from when it comes to, see, that's the thing is when we, let's, let's take the school of September series as an example. Like when, when we're recording one of those episodes, the idea isn't we're we're not I'm not trying to get your opinion on how how you call and kill elk out there for uh, you know everybody else to replicate exactly how you do it because everybody's got a different personality and a different palate how this how the calls will sound or a different strategy or philosophy. What what we're trying to do is try to get people that have been there through the school of hard knocks that have put a lot of elk on the ground to offer their side of it. So that the listener has this mental toolbox that they're going into September with. So they could think, they, they could while they're in the woods and, and a scenario arises, they could think, you know what, I remember Ryan from High Timber Dreams, he talked about this exact thing and this bull started doing this, so I need to do that. And, you know, that's kind of what it is. And and so I, I, I think that when when you kind of, you almost discounted your, your knowledge and experience, but I can always tell when I'm talking to a legitimately good uh, solid elk hunter, and and I feel like I've got one on the phone right now. So um, I, I'd love to get you back on, and and you don't need a discount, you know, or or put some disclaimer that it's just your experience because obviously there's a lot of credibility behind that, and 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 that's the kind of I think that people like you is what hunters like me get the most useful advice and and inspiration, if you will. Um, out of these kind of discussions, and and it actually turns into something tangible when we're out there in September. So I, I'd love to have you on for an episode like that. Oh, I'd appreciate that. It'd mean a lot to us. Hey, uh, one more thing. I know we got to get going, but yeah, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. I heard one of your podcasts recently where you work in Pendleton sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I I, I come down to Pendleton. Uh, I, you know, pre-COVID, it was a lot more common. Um, and, and, and I, I haven't been down there this year at all, but it's, it's, you know, two or three times a year. I, I'll get down to Pendleton, uh, for the day job. Well, yeah. you obviously go I-84 through the ground. Uh-huh. Well, next time you come uh, through, you got a place to stay. You should come by and see what we're all about and hang out for a day or two. Oh, I'd love to. Oh, I don't, don't tempt me with a good time. I'd love to. We'll, we'll record oh, a podcast. I'll show you the dirt, the whole nine yards. <laughs> I love, I love. If nothing more, I'd love to see your property and how you've got it set up and how you're managing it. Um, you know, I, I get, I get pretty excited about that. So, uh, I, I, it's, it'd be a great time. I, 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 and I'd love to do something to help contribute to the cause. Uh, in fact, let's, we, we should wrap that up. So, um, yep. I'm gonna take you up on, on that offer. And and I hope I, you do. I'd love to come see you, and I'd love to bring some maybe some Western Huntsman swag items down that you can give the veterans that are hunting out at your place, um, and, and you. You, I, I need to get you a T-shirt and all that as well. Uh, but let's let's wrap it up with the hunters that are listening to this. How can they help High Timber Dreams? How, how what can they do? I know I touched on that earlier, and then we kind of went off in a different direction. So how can somebody listening to this that's kind of inspired by your cause uh, jump online or whatever and directly support you or help 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 the cause to help our uh, veterans and first responders? Well, firstly, they can, you know, help anyone they can, whether they're a veteran or first responder. I mean, obviously, we'd like to prioritize that, but hunting as a world and the day we live in today is – takes precedence over your status as a veteran or first responder. So just be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, They could follow our our Facebook page. Now, we do have a lot of scammers. If you go to our Facebook page, we've given some pretty epic giveaways away this week. And uh, there's High Dash Timber Dreams. There's High Dash Timber hyphen Dreams. There's blah, blah, blah. We are High Timber Dreams dot. High Timber Dreams, period. Um, you can always reach out to me personally, and I can set you in that direction. Uh, Instagram is High Timber Dreams, one word. And feel free to check out our, our uh, website. It's HighTimberDreams.com. It'll probably tell you everything you want to know about us. But if you really, I'm a trail cam junkie, and so is High Timber Dreams. So if you really like a lot of good, a lot of good videos and pictures of pretty much everything That's that right. comes yep. uh, mm-hmm. page. And here's the other benefit. <laughs> on her website, if you click the three tabs and you go to our sponsor link, um, there's a lot of sponsors on there that we have discounts code, discount codes for. And if mm-hmm. that could benefit anybody, 
and you don't have to be a veteran or first responder to get the discount code, you know, yeah. um, check yeah. that out. And, and we're not about ourselves. We're not asking you to follow our page. You, you make your mind up yourself. Uh, just check us out and make your own mind up and we'll, we'll, we'll going to keep growing regardless. One, one member at a time. I, I love it. Um, I'm on your website right now. And so you can sign up. It looks like, like maybe a newsletter or something like that. High timber you dreams subscribe. or subscribe. Yeah. High timber dreams, making dreams come true. Um, yeah. 2022 sponsors contact about us, our story. Yep. The, the whole, so guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the website in the, in the show notes and the Instagram page. Um, and, and all that. So everything is there. So you guys could jump on there and see if it's something worth supporting. I, I feel like it is. And I, I know I, I ask a lot of the listeners, uh, but it, it hasn't been that way lately. It, usually we're dealing with a bunch of, uh, you know, anti-hunting legislation and stuff through the winter. And, and now that that's all kind of calmed down through the summer. But uh, expect a fight again this coming winter. So anyway. So well, that's know. a whole other podcast down it, the road. It really is. <laughs> it really is. Uh, if you if you ever want to hear my blood pressure get get going, uh, that's the topic we talk about. Um, so I, all all that will be in the show notes, guys. Uh, I'd encourage you to jump on there and check it out. Um, Brian, this has been an excellent converse, conversation. I, I I'm like I feel honored to know you. So I, I appreciate you coming on, and uh, I'd love to get you back on for school of September. That's my favorite subject, and so we're gonna have to do that. And I'll come see you in Legrand. Uh, and, and again, th- thanks a bunch for coming on. Uh, I really, I, I appreciate it. Back at you, Jim. We appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, when you get to the grand, we'll give you directions to our house in Elgin. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Right, yeah. I friend. said Legrand, huh? <laughs> hey, real Elgin. quick. If anybody out there wants to reach out to our Facebook page and send a message or Instagram and send a message and just want to talk about elk hunting or elk calling. I can only tell you what works for us, and I can share some information with you that I've learned from other people that are really successful. Don't hesitate. You don't have to be a veteran or a first responder, just a supporter to get all the information I'll give to you, and, and I hope that matters to somebody. Yeah, I think it does. I, I, I think that goes – and actually, that that's a service to me too. Guys, when you're sending me elk hunting questions, you're not serving yourself. Hit up Ryan. He knows what he's doing. I'll lead you astray. I, I will lead you astray. You, you know uh, more than you think you do. I'm, I'm going to do a <laughs> podcast and you be my guest, and then you'll you'll actually be able. To, you know, I actually <laughs> actually the more questions you're asked, which you're not asked that many, you you will actually probably be able to answer without hesitation about elk calling because you know more than you give yourself credit for. I believe that. Well, I, I appreciate. I, I'm I, at least somebody has faith in me, buddy. But I, I've had a rough couple of years in the oak woods, so my my confidence level isn't that high. But uh, no, again, that's that's awesome. I, I appreciate you offering that up, and, and guys, especially uh, I know a, a few of you out there do have that uh, Mount Emily tag. Um, you know, Ryan might have some info for you. So uh, I definitely will. Yeah, for sure. Well, again, thanks a bunch, Ryan. Hang on the yep. line after we hang up here, and uh, again, let's let's do this again. Uh, Glad we connected, man. Thanks, Jim. You made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. We sure appreciate your support. This is Jim Huntsman signing off and reminding you to check us out at Instagram at The Western Huntsman and on Facebook at The Western Huntsman. And you can also check out the website at thewesternhuntsman.com. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you on the mountain.